Welcome, everybody. We are about to start off day two of the Hi-Fi Summit with Jakob from Dirac. We are going to continue our journey to the top. Here we go. How are you doing, buddy? I am excellent. They have blessed us with some beautiful California weather here in Sweden, so it's really, really hot, no air condition, <laughs> but we enjoy our sun. All right. All right. Hey, so it's day two, Chana. People That's are right. asking if we can outdo day one because they're loving. They loved what happened day one. I oh, think man. we can do it. I, 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 I got think so. Me it's too. On. I slept for almost 10 hours. It was, it was fantastic. And you just took a shower right now and seriously, like, like five minutes. Yeah. That's you crazy. Know? Yeah, you <laughs> got to do it sometimes, you know. This is, this is how it rolls. We got, we got time sensitive stuff going on. So. Well, Enough let's about get into my it. shower. Yes. Let's get into it. All, all I know is I want Dirac in my system. That's what we've been saying like this whole Me time. <laughs> I, I, I want that. I, I, yeah. I did the trial back when they had that trial on the PC. And I'm like, man, this is good. I want this. And oh, then at like the time, I had an option for a mini DSP, right, to get it into that thing. So there, was a, there were some options to get it in uh, to my system. But, yeah, I'm very curious to see, you know, what you have to talk yeah. about. Yeah. Let's do it. Uh, so I have a presentation here. It's sitting in Chrome, so I'm going to scroll through stuff here. OK, you want me to bring it in? There it is. Yes, please. So there's going to be a couple of topics here. going to start out talking about room correction in general and why Direct Live is different from the rest. And then some other topics when it comes to acoustical measurements and microphones and microphone positions and stuff like that that tend to come up fairly often. And then we're going to end up with a couple of minutes of Q&A. Hopefully, okay. you guys will have some questions that we can dig I'm into. I'm sure they will have tons of questions for you. That's good. All right. So room correction as a product, it's a fair, fairly curious thing. Uh, you have this process where you put a microphone in a room and play weird sounds through speakers. And potentially, you also move the microphone around according to instructions. And at the end of the day, some piece of software somewhere is going to make some kind of call for how to make your system sound better. That's a fairly difficult challenge, because what does it even mean? Uh, so in this slide here, we have this plot. So you have a red and a blue trace. So this is actually something that I've borrowed from a speaker review. So there are two different speakers measured in the same position. The speakers are in the same position, and they are clearly different. The question, though, is which one is going to sound the best? Is it the red or the blue speaker? It's not clear at all. And this is typically how speakers are measured. On the x-axis, you have frequency. And on the y-axis, you have, it says amplitude in dB, so basically how loud they are. So we can see that the red speaker has more bass because it has more power at low frequencies. The blue speaker has more high frequency extension. And they both wiggle around between both ends. So which one is going to sound the best? And if you could draw your favorite curve in here, what would it look like? So trying to determine based on this black magic procedure called room correction, how to make this sound better, it's not really clear. Um, so another way to look at speakers in rooms or really any linear system is a metric that is called the impulse response. And that's also often in audio called the transient response. And what this is really is that if you input a very particular signal that is called an impulse, then you measure what shows up on the output. And of course, in hi-fi at least, ideally we want a system that doesn't really do anything. It's supposed to deliver the content as it is on your recording to your ears exactly as it is on the disc or the track, wherever you got it. And well, if you input an impulse, then what you want out should also be an impulse. Because if it's not, then something happened to it. And of course, in practice, all systems will do something to your signal, every single one. So what we see in the plots here on the top one, that's the 
original non-corrected impulse response of a speaker in a room. And you can see that it looks almost furry on the right. And that's because it's nine different positions. So the black trace is the average and the blue ones are nine individual measurement points. So an impulse was in principle, at least input into the system. And this is what is recorded in the microphone position. So we can see that maybe I should start off by that, by the way, an impulse by this definition is a signal that is zero everywhere, except for in one point where it is one. Mm -hmm. So it's basically a single sample that is non-zero and it's a one. So what we see here, and it points upwards, by the way, that's also important. So in the top one, we have some weird wiggle in the beginning, and then it actually starts downwards before it goes up again and then down. Can you see my cursor, by the way? Or is that not showing? Yes, yes, we see it. Yeah. 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 So it starts mm -hmm. down, then it goes up, down, and when we had, have this weird hump at the end, and then it's the same. So interesting to note that all of the blue traces are following the average, meaning they are all the same in the same positions. And then later on, we can see that the blue ones start to be different from the average. And that's because the first part of the impulse response here is the direct wave from the speaker. And then later here, we see that the room starts to introduce different behaviors between different positions. So these are reflections and reverberation and stuff like that. And well, we input an impulse. So what we wanted was zero everywhere until some point where we want a single one, then down to zero again and zero everywhere. And that's not what this uncorrected system looks like. Now, looking at the lower plot, that is after applying Dirac Live to the system. Well, it's clearly still not a perfect impulse, but it starts at zero. Then we have a very sharp rise, 2.8, sharply down. There are some wiggles, and then it's flat until we have the room coming in later in the impulse response. And this is really, when we say that Dirac Live does impulse response correction, this is what we mean. Okay. That the corrected impulse response after using Dirac Live will be much more distinct, and it will be more minimum phase. And exactly what I mean by that, I will come back to. And this is a different thing than looking at these plots, because these plots are all about how much energy do you have about the, in a particular frequency bin, whereas this is all about time. How does the system behave a particular point in time after having had a non-zero sample? So this is looking at the same information basically in the time domain, whereas the red and the blue trace is in the frequency domain. So really, what Dirac Live is trying to do is to make your system as close to minimum phase as possible. And that's a very technical term or academic term. Uh, the definition by itself doesn't mean anything to me, and I don't think it would mean a lot to you either. It concerns zeros and whatnot. But intuitively, the way you can think about that is that it is a system with a particular magnitude response, meaning if we talk about a filter, for instance, it has a certain behavior. It has a certain cutoff, for instance. And it also has the least energy delay, meaning you get as much energy as early as possible. So what this picture is showing is the same filter, meaning looking only at the amount of frequent or amount of power as a function of frequency, they would look identical. But in the time domain, they look really, really different. So they are the blue one, it's the minimum phase representation, and the red one is the linear phase. So if we only look at the power response, they are the same. But the difference really is that in the blue one, you have as much power as early as possible. Whereas the red one, the power is distributed over a longer period of time, and it's also delayed like this. And when we say that we want the system to, the complete system to be minimum phase, then we can go back to these slides here. 
that basically means that you want as much area between the line zero and the trace as early as possible. And in the non-treated system here, you can see that there is a lot of things happening here between zero and 0 0.7 milliseconds maybe. Whereas in the corrected system, all, almost all of the power is in the initial impact of the system. And this is going to lead to, well, a faster system, if you want. It's going to have more attack. It's going to sound crisper. You will have a much nicer stereo reproduction, really. And also, you will have tighter base, because the system is preparing for what is going to happen in the future. Um, another way to describe the same thing is really to call it phase correction. Uh, so I said earlier that the impulse response and the red and the blue speaker trace have the same information, and that's not quite true. The impulse response has more information, and the information that is missing in the red and the blue speaker trace is information about the face of the system. That's the timing part if you're looking at a system in the frequency domain. So what I mean by that is that if we look on this lift picture, for instance, we can see that the lower frequency component, the blue one here, and the green one, that is a higher frequency component, they are now in phase because the peaks of these signals, they match up here and they match up here. Then you put them through a speaker and after, well, they are no longer in phase because these peaks are no longer aligned. So it's similar to time, but it's not quite the same. And phase is a diff difficult thing to think about because if you are listening to a single speaker, for instance, and you just switch the polarity of the speaker cable, you are very unlikely to be able to hear any difference at all. And if you have a stereo system and you switch the polarity of both speakers, well, it's probably going to sound exactly the same. But if you have this perfect stereo setup, everything is tuned to perfection. Best speakers you can find, best treated room and whatnot. And you switch the polarity of just a single speaker, what's going to happen to your soundstage? It's going to be completely ruined. Everything will be out of phase everywhere. And nothing changed about your equipment. Nothing changed about the behavior of your speakers. The only thing that changed is that your front left and front right are now out of phase everywhere. So even if absolute phase for an individual speaker is not important, phase behavior for pairs of speakers are really, really important in order to get the staging right. And phase and impulse responses is also the reason why many people tend to prefer closed enclosures for subwoofers if they are going to use them for music. They're not going to be as efficient, but they're going to be faster and more distinct. So looking at some of the challenges, the acoustical challenges that is addressed by the Dirac Live Room Correction System. The first one is room resonances or standing waves. We try to address that as well as possible. And that is what is in the lower frequencies here. It's basically below the, what is called the Schroeder frequency when the room has the most impact on how your system sounds. Then we have number two and three, which is in this early part of the impulse response that I mentioned earlier, where the average and the individual measurement positions have a very similar behavior. And the way this does not look ideal is one or out of two reasons, or both of them. Either it's driver misalignment, which is really not a property of the room at all, but of the speaker, because building perfect speakers with the best crossovers is difficult and expensive. And another reason are early reflections. And these are then reflections of the front of the speaker itself or from the wall behind the speaker. They will have the same angle of incidence as the direct wave from the speaker, which is why they will be the same in all measurement positions. And if that is the case, then we can actually correct for them as well by 
adjusting the face. And then number four, which is the late part. That's a trick one to address. And you need to think about that a little bit differently because it's going to be different in every point. So if you try to improve something in one point, it's going to be worse in another point. So the best you can do there is really to look on the average of that one and try to apply some kind of gentle EQ to get the average to be as nice as possible. As flat as possible? Well, it doesn't have to be flat. It depends on your preference. Oh, OK. Yeah. Our objective is never to tell you what your system should sound like. So that's huh. really up to you. We have a proposed target curve that you can use. And if you don't like the sound, then you can change it. Gotcha. And this also comes into different types of speakers. If you have a highly directional speaker, you probably want a different target curve than if you have an omnidirectional one, because they're going to excite the room in totally different ways. So really, we are trying just trying to get you the tools to get a very good starting point. And if you want to fine tune it to your particular taste or equipment or room, you're free to do that. Very good. Um, and that's really it on Dirac Live, what it tries to do and the uh, rationale really behind the product itself. We want the impulse response to be as short and minimum phase as possible. Um, so I want to talk a little bit on measurement microphones and their positioning because people tend to ask a fair number of questions on that. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. Um, yeah. Do you guys uh, have a you have specific microphones you recommend for Dirac, or is it you know if you buy a certain type of receiver, whether it's NAD or audio control that has Dirac, um, mm -hmm. you just use their mic? How does that roll? Yeah. So the way it works is that typically, if you buy a Dirac Live enabled capable product like an NAD or some other brand. It will ship with a microphone, and that microphone is known to be OK. It's going to need a microphone calibration file that we produce for that particular microphone. OK, so it is a and calibrated it, microphone with a, uh, with a cal yeah, uh, calibrator. Yeah, exactly. That's included right. in the product. But then also, some people want to invest in a more premium microphone, because these included microphones tend to be maybe difficult to position the way you want, because it's going to be these Odyssey style microphones that you need to place in your couch. And they are not always easy to mount on a tripod or something like that. Right, right. And then people, well, there are all kinds of brands of microphones out there. The important part, though, is that any microphone is not going to do it. Even if it's a premium expensive microphone, maybe it's going to be really, really unsuitable. And mm -hmm. the way to know if it's suitable for room correction or not is by understanding what type it is. So there are a couple of different types of microphones that are available here. And it's only one that is suitable for room correction. And that is the omnidirectional one. So right. these red plots here are called the polar plots for microphones. And they try to tell you what's the pickup in the microphone like for different angles surrounding the microphone. So the omnidirectional microphone will pick up sounds from all angles the same. Whereas looking at the very right one, the shotgun microphone, it's a directional microphone. It's what they use when they hunt celebrities on TV to be able to hear what they say at a distance. Right. And it can really only pick up sound for, for, from the front. And then there's all kinds of things for various types of singing environments or right, instruments right. or whatnot. And all of those really, really should not or even cannot be used for room correction. It doesn't help that it's a very nice, expensive microphone. They are not built for this. They cannot really do it. So this is also important if you connect the microphone to your PC to make sure to select your measurement microphone and not select the speaker array in your laptop, for instance, because that's built for teleconferencing. So that's strongly beamforming to pick up the sound in front of the laptop and cancel out sounds from the sides which is not what we want from for room correction duties so just looking at what is it we try to do we can see here we have some kind of sound source in a room and the sound is gonna bounce around all over the place there's no way of knowing where is a reflection gonna come from and in the end it's gonna come from all directions 
and we don't want the reflection in the recording to be colored differently just because the angle is different. We need to capture the reflections the same as the direct wave from the speaker. And also looking at this picture, it's interesting to try to understand how do you know what is the direct wave and what is reflections? And using only a single microphone position is really, really difficult to do that, which is why Dirac Live uses multiple measurement positions. There are many reasons to it, but a very, very strong reason to use more than one position is to be able to determine what is the direct sound from the speaker and what is reflected sound. And to be able to understand what can and cannot be corrected for. So how many um how many microphone placements or positions do you usually run in your standard um Dirac room correction yeah i'm a lazy person so i always try to do the minimum amount of work <laughs> <laughs> Empir empirically in your typical home five measurement points is the least you should be doing okay uh, nine is the recommended number and nine, you can do okay. up to 17. so if you go into custom install spaces maybe you want 12 seats that all have good sound then you should probably do more measurements. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Um, then it's the positioning. So it's perhaps not super easy to see, but here we have two speakers. And then we have the microphone in the middle. I'm not sure if you can see it. I draw drew a coordinate system over them. Right, right. So right. the microphone, the microphone in the center yeah, there, yeah. Yeah. And a measurement microphone should always point towards the ceiling, which is strange. People sometimes expect it should point towards the speakers. That seems, uh, I mean, that seems like it makes sense, right? We're trying to get a measurement from the speakers, but yeah. Um, but it makes sense uh, to me that an om omnidirectional microphone should be pointing up to the ceiling when we're taking. <laughs> Yeah, measurements for surround space, especially with Atmos and DTSX, right? Yeah, I mean, you could think about it. Maybe pointing them towards the speaker would make sense in stereo, but if you have speakers behind you, then that's not very helpful. And the polar pattern only says something in the plane. So regardless of which direction around the microphone, it's going to be the same. So this way, it doesn't matter if the speakers are in front of the microphone or behind the microphone it's all going to be picked up the same. Whereas if you point it towards a particular speaker, the speakers will be recorded differently. And this is also important to understand if you get a third party microphone that comes with a calibration file, because often these microphones have multiple calibration files, where one is for on axis, meaning for use if you point it towards the speaker, which you shouldn't do. Then there is an off axis calibration file which is meant for use when you point it towards the ceiling, for instance, because you measure 90 degree off axis for the microphone, so to say. So that is the calibration file that you should use when you point it towards the ceiling like this. Gotcha. OK. Yeah. And measuring system, it's, it's also tricky because you can do it many different ways, but the basis is always the same. You play an own signal, you record whatever comes out, you compare what you sent in to what you got out. That's the basis. And if you want to measure only the magnitude, meaning the amplitude as a function of frequency, then you can move the microphone around, you can just play a noise, and you're going to see it update so you have this real-time spectrum analyzer thing going on. The thing you don't get there, though, is the face of the system, which means that you also cannot measure the full impulse response. In order to do that, you need to be able to compare the input sample by sample. There is some hip hiccup there, though. Uh, also, on the measurement signal, in theory, any wideband signal would work, meaning a signal that excites the full frequency spectrum. So black metal could be 
a very good signal potentially theoretically whereas a singer songwriter maybe not so much because it excites only a small part of the spectrum at any given time and a white noise or a sign sweep both have the special property that they are very wideband white noise contains all frequencies at random and the sign sweep starts at a very low end and then progressively plays higher and higher frequencies until it has played the full frequency spectrum and for various reasons I won't go into, the sign sweep is nicer to work with when you want to actually get an impulse response as your measurement, because the order of the frequency component is known. You know that you started with the base stuff and then you're going to end up with the treble, and it's going to be linear or logarithmic in between. So that's helpful in the comparison work when you compare it to what you put into the system and want to check what comes out. And this is really, really key when you want to measure impulse responses. Timing is extremely critical because, like I said, you need to compare it sample by sample. And clock drift and stuff like that is always difficult in audio. And the same for room correction systems, actually. And looking at the direct live product, you can and you are allowed to connect the microphone to your PC, for instance, and then the test signal is going to be played back by your amplifier or AV processor or whatever it is. But that now means that the microphone has one clock generated by your PC. Your probe AV processor has another clock that is generated internally there for playback. So even if they are both 48K, there are going to be two different instances of 48K meaning they will drift. And this is also, of course, the source of jitter and stuff like that in digital transmission. So that makes it impossible to compare the known signal to the recording because they will be different length. That's pretty much guaranteed. And if they are different length, then they can't be compared sample by sample. So how to go about that? And I often get the question, why do we play one extra sweep? So in a stereo system, for instance, we play one sweep on the left speaker, then one on the right, and then another one on the left. On 5.1, we're going to play one sweep on every speaker, and then at the end, we play an additional sweep on the first speaker. That's always the case. Regarding, regardless of the number of channels, we will play one sweep in every speaker, and the first one will be get another sweep at the very end. And the reason we sweep one speaker twice is not because we are more curious about the performance of that one, but to be able to compare the two recordings of the same speaker to each other. By doing that comparison, we can calculate the clock drift between the clock for the microphone and the clock for the playback system. And that allows us to recalculate the recording to be able to compare them sample by sample. And this is key in order to measure impulse responses. And if you have used software like REW, for instance, you know that it gets tricky if you have two different sound cards for the microphone and the playback part. And then you can have a dedicated channel only for timing information and stuff like that. And the way we work around the fact that these systems are actually asynchronous is by having this extra sweep. And of course, you can ask, but why don't you just connect the microphone to the unit and have them sit on the same clock? And that can be done, and then there is no problem. But because of custom install, for instance, where the equipment is going to sit in a control room 300 feet away, that's not really practical. So it's basically a market requirement for us to allow you to connect to the AV processor over the network, that, and then the processor is going to sit somewhere else out of cable length for you to connect the microphone there. All right, then measurement positions. This is a topic that comes up a lot. Your favorite. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so for those of you that have used Dirac Live, you know that at one point in the process, you get asked about your listening space. Maybe it's a couch, maybe it's a chair, maybe it's a cinema or something. And then there is this illustration and it's going to show you the measurement points. So this is something that I threw together in 
PowerPoint from the same graphics we use in the oh, software. So for instance, here we have the sofa, and it has nine measurement points. So people wonder a lot about what does do they even mean? How closely must I adhere to this? And the answer is not closely at all. So there are, like I mentioned earlier, you should always do at least five. You can do up to 17. And all of the measurement points are treated the same except one. And that is the very first measurement point that you do. Thinking about it, it should be intuitively clear that the speakers can only have the same arrival time in one single point, right? Taking it to the extreme, maybe you sit on top of the left speaker and then the right speaker is 10 meters away. Well, then you need to delay the left speaker because you're really close to it and the right one is far away. Right. And doing that, the sound is going to arrive to you at the same time. But of course, a person sitting on the other speaker is going to have a worse situation. So the speaker's arrival time for the sound waves or wave fronts can only be simultaneous in one single point. And that point is the first measurement point. So you should place that one where you want to have the best stereo imaging, for instance. So for example, in this situation, we have a couch. You don't know where you're gonna sit, not really, or don't really care. Well, place it in the middle then, because that's typically where people expect to have the best sound. And then after that, well, space the positions as equally as you can. The exact locations are not important at all. If possible, try to get some diversity also in height because you have room modes be between the ceiling and the floor as well. So ideally not keeping it in the plane is nice. And then just spread it out as much as you can in the intended listening area. So for instance, this type of microphone positioning would be used when you want generally a good sound in the whole couch. But you don't need to stick to the instructions, of course, if you know what you're about. So maybe in this couple, she is much more picky about sound. Well, then place the first measurement point where she intends to sit. You can also choose to place more microphone position closer to that seat and then have fewer in the other seat. And what this will tell the algorithm is basically, well, in this seat is more important because now seven out of nine measurement position is going to be fairly closely coupled to what it sounds like in her seat and only two in his seat. And that will give a result that will tend to favor good sound in her seat over his. So using this method, you can, well, everyone is not equally picky about sound. Or if you have a very big piece of furniture, for instance, and you tend to sit in one spot the most time, or if you only ever sit in one seat, why don't you just knock yourself out and go wild like this one? Right. If you know, we all, yeah. So it doesn't matter the shape of the furniture. If you have a couch, but you use it as a chair, well then measure it like a chair. It's completely up to you. And, it's also important to think about it because almost all of the direct live equipment out there have multiple filter settings, meaning you can choose different target curves for different content and stuff like that. And if you want to, you can also have different measurement points. So if she is the main user of this audio system, maybe she has this one with one set of target curves for when she is using it alone. And then she has this one when the family is going to have cozy Friday evening together watching Netflix. And then you can just switch between them with a click on the remote control. That's definitely so handy. Yeah, it is. So it's not only the target curve you can change. You can also base the whole calibration on different sets of measurements depending on where in the room you intend to be. So it's it's a weighted it's weighted based on the first measurement, right? It's not weighted based on the first measurements. It's weighted based on how many measurement points you have mm. in a particular area. I see. Do you have a, do you have a filter for kids so that if I do my measurement, it filters out whatever they're doing 
while I'm doing the measurement? Mm -hmm. We do. And that's a part of the comparison thing because we use the uh, sign sweep. I was just joking, but okay. No, <laughs> but we do actually. All it's right. Very, it's know. very insensitive to disturbances actually, which is very important. I mean, we also have business in automotive, for instance. Mm -hmm. So one customer, they have their audio department ne next to the hardware prototyping department. Uh -huh. So they have a lot of big machinery sitting in the room next door. And it's rarely a problem to do acoustical measurements, even if it's fairly noisy there. And this really oh, comes okay. into how we do the measurements. When you're able to reclock the measurements and compare them sample by sample, you know exactly what you're looking for. You don't need to take the whole recording. It's easy to disregard things you know cannot possibly be there that's great so having yeah so having a kid talking in the background yeah we didn't put that in there and yeah. we are far, fairly confident that the speaker didn't put it there either that should so be part of the marketing right there <laughs> you can have the kids in the background how about you know uh, staying on that uh how about how about like air conditioning though because that's more like white noise it's playing a lot of different frequencies i would imagine Yes, and that's a difficult one. More ah. difficult, got it. Yeah, so it's more, much more wideband. Got it. And it tends to be there in every measurement as well. Because what you could, we don't do that, but what you could do if you wanted to is to start comparing different measurement points to each other and see, okay, we didn't expect this in this point because it wasn't in any of the other eight positions. So we should probably ask someone to remeasure this point or filter something out. Uh, but wideband noise is really difficult, right? Like right. Air, air condition units, for instance. That's, Got it. That's tricky. Yeah. Well, you know, this is an awesome presentation. I love understanding and learning about all this. Um, yeah. All you know, there's the questions. There you go. Hands up. Yeah. yeah. I, all I know, you know, I don't know if I took that all in. I'm probably gonna have to rewatch to understand all of it. Um, yeah. But um, all I know is that I want that in my system. That's it. <laughs> yeah. So whatever you do, I know that I've tried it out. When you used to uh, do those uh, like trials, and I just remember thinking, yeah. like, my system sounds clear. I don't know what they did specifically, but uh, I just want that on every system that I have here. So yeah. uh, I know NAD has uh, that stuff. I saw the T778. I totally want that thing. Yeah. You know, so Dirac on the entire system, that's awesome. Yeah. And if you have a two channel system, you also have the NAD M10 and C658. So you yeah, don't need a home yeah. theater to get room correction. Yeah, and if but you I do try want it, it on out, a home theater. Yeah. <laughs> I, I want and that on all the speakers, it. right? Yeah, you do. Yeah. And you can also try all this as a software only by if you have a system that can load an audio plugin for streaming media and stuff like that. Really? Because yeah, I remember our... I, I checked a while back and there was no, uh, for a while, there was no option to do the trial anymore. But you're saying yeah, you so, can now. <clears throat> yeah, that old product is discontinued. We have replaced it with a different one now that was released fairly recently. So that one you can trial for free, but you still need to get your hands on a measurement microphone somehow. Okay. Sounds good. So we have some questions here. John, are you gonna bring those up? Yep. Here's a good one. Uh, can you talk about what Dirac base management adds versus regular Dirac? Yeah, I can do that. So Target curves, I didn't talk much about that here, but it's a desire for the magnitude response after room correction. And that's nice, of course, but looking at the home theater system, maybe I have one subwoofer, maybe I have four. So what you care about is not really what is the average magnitude response for a particular subwoofer or a speaker. You only care about what is the average magnitude response when something is playing on my front left. So what mm -hmm. you would want to do is to set the target curve per input channel and not having to think about what is the sum of my full range speakers and one or more subwoofers. So really, if I play something on this input channel, this is the output I want. And that's really one of the main things it adds. And also the reason people add more than one subwoofer, of course, is not to get more bass, it's to get better bass. Okay. Because to really deal with room modes, you need more than one speaker. So we have a cloud-based machine and learning algorithm that looks at all subwoofers in the system and tries to figure out the best combination of gains, delays, and phases individually to minimize the spatial variations. Wow. When, when it's implemented in some of these uh, devices, does it also do something where it tests the, the frequency response of a certain speaker to help it you know, to set the crossover points and things like that? Yeah, it, it does. does. Okay. Yeah. 
And you can set the crossover here as a part of the target curve as well. Oh, yeah, I you saw the target curve is very interesting because you can just you know shape it however you want. Yeah, you know, exactly. um, your target curve, I believe, was not a flat curve, right? No, it's not. It's similar to what people like to call the Harman curve because of all the historical that. research that yeah. Harman has provided the industry with into psychoacoustics. So that's a very good starting point. But in the end, maybe that's not what you want. And then knock yourself out and set what you want or share with your friends or. Yeah. yeah. And that's awesome because I didn't want to have to go and research like, how do I do the target Harman curve? <laughs> what is the yeah. DB <laughs> at 20 hertz? Okay, plus. Okay. So that's awesome that that's kind of like the starting point already. If you get yeah, a, a product with, with your, with Dirac on there. Uh, what other questions there? Here's another one. Does Dirac have secret menus for professional audio calibrators? Professional audio calibrators. So that I, would I be it's... custom install, I guess. Yes. Custom installs, custom integrators. Yeah. Not really. No. Um, it's so the same if you're that just is... a consumer, you're getting the full Dirac yeah. experience, right? Yes. Oh, that's very are. good to know. Yeah. The main difference is that they are going to make heavy use of the fact that you can connect the microphone to your PC, whereas a consumer maybe will do it on his smartphone. But that requires to connect the microphone to the equipment, which is really right. impractical for professional use. Understood. Understood. Here's another one. What are the differences between Dirac implementations in various pieces of equipment, say, for instance, between mini DSP and Datasat? Um, that used to be an easy question. Now it's a bit more difficult. In 2017, we redid the whole calibration tool. Mm -hmm. And some of the older equipment haven't really migrated to support that. So that would be an actual difference. Okay. In terms of what software we support for that. In terms of how it sounds, they should all be the same though. There are a couple of different filters or filter options because various DSPs are good at different things. So two different pieces like a mini DSP and a data set then just to pick the same two have different implementations, but they should sound the same within 60 dB or something like that. Gotcha. Understood. Very cool. Looking through the the chat here, if there's anything else, uh, other questions here. Um, oh, here's a great, great one. What is the cheapest AVR that has DRAC? Yeah, to the best of my knowledge, that would be the NAD T758. 758. Um, 758, yeah. okay. And that would be, I don't know if it has updated. I think it released at 12.99 US for a full 714 Dolby see, Atmos. I see it here as 13.99 at upscale audio. Um, that's actually very wow. Yeah, I, didn't know that. I still want the 778, but that's that's good yeah. to know that that's <laughs> available. Mm -hmm. No, definitely. Um, that's cool. Yeah. I did not know that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a steal. I have it myself. No, oh, uh, quick, oh, okay. Now, quick question. I know that you you have uh, the curtains on mm -hmm. there, so you can limit the uh, the correction below a certain frequency. Do you recommend doing that, like below five? What five hundred hertz, seven hundred hertz? What's the depending on the room, uh, I guess. I personally don't do that at all. Mm, you let is, it run full. Yeah, uh, I like that. Everyone mm. doesn't. So, mm. I mean, if you have some more exotic type of speaker that is supposed to excite the room widely at high frequencies, then maybe you don't want to correct for that. And that's fine because you yeah. bought the speakers because you like that kind of sound. Then you can use the curtain to say, don't correct mm -hmm. about 3K or above 700 or however you want. So it's a setting that says, correct from here to here and then don't touch anything else. Then you can get that. Yeah, so I guess it's one of those things where it's partially how good your speakers actually are. Like, so if you have some great speakers, maybe you may, you know, I like the way that that sounds like yeah. whatever. I want to keep it that way. So that, but also personal preference. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, to me, it's definitely preference because in my mind, speakers that I like, they don't need to be good. I just need to <laughs> like the way they sound. Yeah. But also, of course, it's important for me. I bought them because I like how they sound and I don't want any room correction to change that. Got it. So yeah. work, working with the target curve to actually maintain that sound and get what you like 
I mean, knock I, yourself out. There are no rights or wrong here. I right. understand. Yeah, you're not. You want the speaker to sound like the speaker that you bought has mm -hmm. that same exactly. sound signature. I get it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's awesome. You have the option, though. You know, if you want to yeah. change that, then your stuff will help that. Uh, how about the M10? I know the M10, the NAD M10 also has that. That's a two channel. Yeah, 2.2 .2 actually. So you can have two independent subwoofers as well. 2.2. 2.2. Yeah. What else we got here? Um, another question. Will Durac, uh, uh to provide on-demand calibration via software for those who don't change their setup often instead of end users buying the perpetual software for a hefty premium? Ooh. That would probably be something a custom installer would do for you. Mm. But the question can also, of course, also be read. I know there are other companies out there that where you pay per calibration. So that could be something that he's thinking about. Mm. It's not something that we have really considered. But if there is a demand, who knows? How, how quick is it to change? Can you change between different profiles? That, that depends between equipment. Ah. Some are really quick, others take longer. But on the NED equipment, again, for instance, it's fractions of a second. And you can do it directly from the remote control. OK. And, and also, the EQ that was setting the house, it's, it's also done after, right? So it calibrates to a certain flat, I'm assuming, and then you adjust from there? Not really. You export no. it with the house curve as well. So that's a part of the calibration. So mm. you can just use these different ones to switch between different house curves if you want to. Got it. So you should think about this room correction system as taking care of all of the tricky face and impulse response stuff for you invisibly. And then it allows you to set the house curve on top of that. All right. And then it all comes together in one package. So when you switch between the profiles, you switch everything. I want it. Uh, <laughs> what, else, what else do we have here in the chat? There's, um, uh, microphone positions. Uh, I've heard previously that stereo pointed speakers and home theater pointed the ceiling. Would you agree with that? Uh, or do we? Yeah, I, mean, I think you already said really. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. I always point at the ceiling. But if you right. have a very, very well treated room, well, try it. I, I live in a standard home and I have plenty of reflections from behind me. And yeah. I don't want them to have a different coloration than the direct wave. I had a quick question about that because you were talking about the different directivity of the microphones and omnidirectional. Uh, it would seem to me if it was a perfectly omnidirectional microphone that it wouldn't matter where you pointed it, right? But exactly. I'm, I'm assuming that it's not perfectly omnidirectional. Is that what you're No, they are omnidirectional in the plane, so to say, meaning oh, that if okay. you point it straight up, then in the 90 degree angle of incidence, it's going to be all the same. But of course, at 60 degrees, it's also going to be all the same. But it's not going to be, same, be the same as 90. OK. I just assume Which, that, that when I see those polar patterns, that that's a, that's a, you know, a 3D thing. Right. Yeah, there are 3D polar patterns as well. But they tend to get fairly messy. Got it. Yeah. Um, let's see. Very good. Any other questions here? I think that's, that's pretty much it. Um, you know, thank you. Uh, to the folks at uh, Lenbrook, NAD, uh, PSB uh, is our, our gold sponsor. So uh, thank you to them for, for allowing us to do this and have you on. So that's awesome. Um, yeah. All yeah. right. Thank you, so much yeah. thank you guys for having me. All right. Hey, take sure. care. Um, go ahead, Chana, take us out. All right, everyone. That was wrapping up. Talk number one for day two of the Hi-Fi Summit. Don't forget to jump into the lobby chat um, to hang out. We will be back in about 10 minutes with our next talk. All right, guys. Our journey to the top continues. Thanks, Jake. Jakob. Sorry. Jakob. That's how you, you say it. All right. <laughs> Thanks Stay a lot. Stay cool over there. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.